Dim candlelight flits through the darkness of your living room, barely illuminating the face of the medium across from you. You look down at the table. Ringed by white candles, the medium's hands meet yours upon the surface of a small, spade-shaped puck, which in turn rests upon the surface of a large, occult-looking board, covered in letters. You question the medium, who relays your questions to the ether, but the house remains quiet. So you probe deeper and ask for a name. The puck remains still, but the candles flicker for a moment, as though someone had walked past them. You think you hear footsteps from the other room and turn to look, but the medium demands that you keep focusing on the Ouija board, keep asking it questions. You do as they say, your questions probe deeper, and the responses intensify. Soon, you hear footsteps all around you, doors opening and closing on their own, objects flying off the shelf, but still, the medium asks you to focus on the board, on them, on anything else. Suddenly, beneath your hands, the puck starts to spell out a word. Now imagine if, instead, the medium and the Ouija board were a telephone operator on a switchboard, listening for alien signals. Or imagine it was an engineer on an Arctic research base, deciphering messages from an unknown number station. Or imagine it was you, in your bedroom, bathed in blue moonlight, having a conversation with something through the notepad on your computer. That's Interface Horror. If you found your way to this video, then chances are you're very familiar with that sound. Not just because of the myriad climate change induced catastrophes ravaging your town at any given moment, but because you've probably seen a lot of analog horror videos. In case you have no idea what I'm talking about, however, I'll give you the rub. Analog horror is a subgenre of found footage horror that uses the audiovisual technology of the 20th century, read analog technology, to build tension. While analog horror has shifted towards short films and video series, a lot of this subgenre's stylistic signatures stem from its roots in the ARGs, or alternate reality games, of the mid-2010s. Like, while the subgenre has shifted away from the ARG format of codebreaking and multimedia sleuthing, it still uses the second-person perspective to personally rope the viewer into the mystery. You'll still find lots of arcane little clues hidden in analog horror videos, but crucially, Unlike in an ARG, these clues are more subtext than text. They're little details, sprinkled in so that attentive viewers can round out their understanding of the lore and not puzzles that need to be solved in order to progress the story. Having spawned online, analog horror has gained a lot of popularity online, with series like Local 58 and Gemini Home Entertainment accumulating millions of views. If you've seen old videos of distorted old news broadcasts getting hijacked under a blizzard of VHS static, or an old training video casually walking employees through the taxonomy of eldritch horrors, then you've seen analog horror. Now, I love analog horror as much as the next guy, but can I ask a question? You know, horror fan to horror fan? Is analog horror getting a little stale? I see a lot of similar variations on similar themes, all told in very similar ways. I still go nuts every time I see some kind of grainy news footage from 1994 of like, a meat moon in the sky, but there are like three different meat moons out there now. Just sort of feels like if you've seen one analog horror series, you've seen them all. I know that a subgenre in its infancy is going to have its swath of imitators, 
but maybe it just seems that way because we're only looking at one medium. What happens when we take the aesthetic and thematic values of analog horror and translate them to the medium of video games? Are we still left with analog horror? Or are we then looking at some new kind of nostalgic horror? For the sake of the video, we'll call these analog horror video games by a different name, one befitting the niche's unique features. We'll call it Interface Horror. I want to zoom in on this little slice of a slice of a genre to see how it fits into analog horror, where it drifts away, and most importantly, what it looks like. Let's start with the game that first turned me on to the idea of Interface Horror, No Code's 2018 release, Stories Untold. The game is a series of four horror vignettes, each centered around using some suite of 20th century tech to solve puzzles that build to some certifiably spooky climax. The first vignette has you playing a text adventure game on an old PC. The second has you volunteering to operate medical equipment in a mysterious science experiment. The third has you deciphering radio messages in an isolated arctic monitoring station. And the fourth... Uh, plays like a greatest hits record of the previous three on a bad salvia trip, which is to say, it gets a little crazy. A singular narrative throughline connects each vignette, drawing you deeper into the mystery of a car accident that seems to have traumatized the player character, both emotionally and physically. As befits such a story, psychological horror drives the main thrust of the narrative. The game constantly makes you question the reality of the world around your character and the reliability of your character as a narrator. You'll ask yourself, why are these same motifs popping up everywhere? Is my character actually alone? Is anything in this story real? By the fourth vignette, it becomes readily apparent that the titular stories untold are actually the confused dreams of the player character concocted by his damaged brain to distance himself from the guilt he feels for driving drunk, killing his sister in the accident, and planting the whiskey bottle that sauced him on the driver he crashed into. It's a dark subject matter, made sinister in the way it leaks into the mundanity of the vignettes. Scary in the way it makes you question whether you or anyone else would have done things differently. And while this is all very good plot-driven psychological horror, I'd argue that much of the tension building in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is a different kind of psychological horror, one linked to the machine interfaces in front of you. See, for all of stories untold, except for two sections at the very end of the game, the player can't really move. You can use the mouse to look around the scene, and in the second and third parts, you can use Tab to switch your view from one side of the room, with a puzzle key, to the other, with the puzzle itself. Those limited movement options aside, you are, and this is crucial, locked into that position. A 20th century interface dominates your field of view. You can't turn around or even look that far in one direction, and you can't get up and leave. Limiting the player's access to information like this makes for excellent horror. The game designers effectively lock you up in a straitjacket like Hannibal Lecter, wheel you into a haunted murder house, and leave you there, at the mercy of whatever ghosts and ghouls might be lurking just beyond your periphery. The first three stories play out pretty similarly. You, locked into place, have to solve puzzles with a rapidly deteriorating piece of 20th century technology, as something tries to contact you through said technology. When the computer stops referring to you, the protagonist of the text adventure game, and starts referring to you, the player of said game, you can't get up, turn it off, or look away. When the computer starts demanding that you input specific commands, the only way to make it stop is to comply. And as the computer and the room around it further decay, you're left with no choice but to keep fiddling with the interface to progress, and in turn, draw the hidden threat closer. But of course, just the notion of sharing your space with some unseen entity isn't really terrifying on its own. In true analog horror fashion, Stories Untold uses its sound design to really sell that possibility to the player, 
The dial-up screeching, sine wave humming, and number station mumbling of the game's interfaces can play suddenly or sound abrasive enough to put the player on edge. But what stands out to me is the artificiality of many of the game's sounds. Combined with the game's themes of isolation and intrusion, such artificial sounds are cast into doubt. Is this machine sounding off because of what you just did? Because of what something else just did? Or is it just sounding off because that's what it does when it's idling. Another good example of this interface horror is David Szymanski's 2022 game, Iron Lung. Aesthetically, it takes 20th century tech about as far back as it can go. The rusty, coal-powered coffin of a submarine you're trapped in looks more steampunk than anything else. Presenting itself as much more explicitly alien than most analog horror, Iron Lung sets itself in a grim dark future where every habitable planet and every star around which a habitable planet orbited suddenly disappeared, leaving only dark, blood-filled moons to hang in an empty night sky. Given the game's aesthetic choices, you might think it's a stretch to call it analog. But hey, the Titanic was a marvel of analog technology. It steamed out of the harbor right at the start of the 20th century, and unlike our submarine, it didn't even have radar. Which, incidentally, is the only reason you've ever heard of the Titanic. Gameplay-wise, though, Iron Lung follows in the footsteps of stories untold. Welded into a claustrophobic clunker of a submarine, you, a lone convict, must solve a series of simple puzzles using a minimalist navigation console. The console allows you to view where obstacles are relative to the submarine, to change its angle, and to move backwards and forwards relative to that angle. The puzzles themselves are mostly just about using the navigation interface and puzzle key to maneuver your submarine to a point of interest and taking a picture of it through a crappy Game Boy Pocket camera mounted to the front of the hull. As with Stories Untold, you can access the puzzle key by pressing tab, and the challenge comes from negotiating obstacles like walls and other things exclusively through the bare bones control console. It might be clear by now that Iron Lung, too, revels in the horror of the unknown. While, unlike in Stories Untold, you actually can move and look around, there are really only three different screens of interest. And except for the crappy front-facing camera, you're blind to the world around you. Even the things you do know for sure are incomplete. Like, through the radar, you know whether or not something is close to you, but you can only estimate where it is based on an incomplete map, the nearest cardinal direction that the radar is beeping at, and the rate at which the radar is beeping. The threat of a crash always looms over you, especially when you're gliding through some blotchy, ill-defined part of the map. The points of interest, one of the only concrete pieces of information that Iron Lung feeds you, don't help with those feelings of uncertainty. Only viewable through the Home Depot CCTV camera, the points of interest range from rocks, to building walls, to skeletons, to psychic anomalies. Each photograph you take leaves you with more questions than answers, the low quality photos only creating more blanks for your mind to fill in. But Iron Lung also relies heavily on its sound design for tension building. Though Stories Untold relies on temporal distance and artificiality to make its noises threatening, Iron Lung relies on its setting of an alien blood ocean and the acoustics of being underwater to warp every external sound into something mysterious and terrifying. Was that just the rumble of the submarine? Or is something moving around outside? Is that the moaning of an agitated sea monster, or is that a thermal vent erupting? Could it just be the engine of the submarine complaining? Every sound, no matter how familiar, gets distorted to the point of ambiguity, leaving its origin up to the fathomless depths of the player's imagination. To end this odyssey with a game that looks and feels more traditionally analog horror, we'll take a look at Day 178. The game puts the player in the shoes of someone who hasn't left their home in 
unsurprisingly, 178 days after a mysterious event caused the government to issue a total lockdown. Reminders of this dreary new normal surround our protagonist in the form of periodic emergency broadcast messages, faltering electricity, and a grey, rain-soaked cityscape just outside the windows. It also exists in the form of pneumatic tubes installed by the state into every home so that people can receive basic goods like food and medicine. That is, as long as they can afford those things. Our protagonist, unable to work from home, turns to dealing drugs through the tubes to get by. After a drug deal with Samuel L. Jackson goes awry, however, The stuff I sent you is stuck in the sorting center, and I have no way of taking it back without leaving my house. Our protagonist must venture into the dangerously empty city to fix the deal himself. Like in our other two games, the player drives the story along by interacting with analog technology to solve simple puzzles. I'm talking things like listening to the phone for a security code, or fiddling with an old radio to listen for a security code. There's a lot of security codes in this game, but compared to our other two games, the puzzles here are especially sparsely spaced and simple. This creates a game less focused on solving puzzles than it is on finding them, creating little exploration challenges to discover individual pieces strewn about several different maps. In order to find those puzzle pieces and progress the story, the player has to explore not only their apartment, but their apartment complex, a municipal utility station, and an entire city block. Whereas stories untold and iron lung lock you into place and force you to interact with one or two pieces of analog tech for the bulk of their runtime, Day 178 has you walking and looking around it so much that you might even consider it a walking simulator. And though Day 178 departs from our other two subjects in terms of gameplay, it echoes their themes and aesthetics almost perfectly. Like them, Day 178 tries to smother you with the horror of the unknown. For example, neither we nor the protagonist are told what caused the lockdown in the first place. Is it aliens? A meat moon? A massive and unethical government experiment that puts MK Ultra to shame? Compounding these questions is the fact that before the protagonist ventures out of their apartment, they mention their fear of being seen. But seen by what? The unknown threat? Brainwashed neighbors? A meat moon? The game never answers any of these questions, instead opting to have the emergency broadcasts vaguely allude to some bright, noisy threat that can come from outside, or inside, of a person's home. Even the glimpses of horror we do catch are rendered unknowable. The world is crunched into static by low render distance, the form and function of objects are flattened by PS1-esque models and textures, details are smeared across magnetic tape by a shroud of VHS artifacting, and threats are hidden behind a smokescreen of visual noise. It got to the point where I didn't even know what I was looking at half the time, and in any other game that distortion might bother me. But in a game so obsessed with the unknown and with analog technology, I found myself compelled by it. The dated distress of the visuals transforms the game itself into a product of analog tech, much like the photographs from the crappy camera in Iron Lung. Day 178 extends this analog artifacting to its sound design as well. Like the other games, the 20th century machines that drive the game's narrative also belt out artificial and unnerving sounds. But what I find unique about Day 178 is that it crunches sounds both familiar and inscrutable under heavy audio distortion. Do not respond to knocks on your windows or doors. Through bass boosts, high-pass filters, and a cruel amount of EQ, you can almost feel the jagged pain of warped sound waves assaulting your eardrums. And under the constant hiss of VHS static and droning of dying synths, you almost stop trusting your ears entirely. Where Iron Lung uses its setting to transform mundane sounds into unnerving harbingers of doom, 
Day 178 uses the drawbacks of decaying analog tech to thrust its soundscape directly into the depths of the uncanny. And there, in the depths of the uncanny, the picture of interface horror paradoxically becomes clear. Mechanically, interface horror veers into the realm of the walking simulator, which is to say the realm of mechanical simplicity. Other than maybe some walking and looking around, the only other mechanic at the player's disposal is pressing a button on an object in the game world to interact with it. Of course, with interface horror's focus on, well, interfaces and control panels, the ability to interact with objects can become the ability to punch numbers into a keypad, zoom through microfilm, or pilot a submarine. One button at a time, granted, but in these games, complex strings of primitive object interactions form simple puzzles that drive narratives. And I find that interesting. Because although the puzzles of interface horror games lack the sheer complexity of the hidden codes and ciphers of analog horror's ARG ancestors, they certainly make homage to them. The Morse code puzzle in Stories Untold, the radio puzzle in Day 178, and even the navigation of the unfinished parts of the map in Iron Lung harken back to that feeling of straining your senses and pulling info from the static. And given that you need to complete these puzzles in order to progress the story, interface horror seems to stay truer to the ARG roots of analog horror than even some of the canonized classics do. Aesthetically, it seems like interface horror games lack cohesion with one another. Circling back to the beginning of the video, if you've seen one analog horror video, you could instantly recognize any other. The low-budget, lost media style and heavy VHS artifacting carve out an instantly identifiable niche for the genre. The same is not immediately true for our interface horror games. Stories Untold takes a more realistic approach to art direction, while Iron Lung does a 180 into the PS1 horror approach, and Day 178 just slaps a dying VHS look on top of that. But as it so happens, my reasons for coining the term interface horror are largely aesthetic. The field of view in these games is either dominated by analog interfaces, in the cases of stories untold, or meant to look as though it was ripped straight from an analog display, in the cases of Iron Lung in Day 178. Hell, even the latter two games are dominated by analog interfaces at some point. You can't navigate the Blood Ocean without filling your screen with the navigation console, and you can't find or input security codes without filling your face with old tech. All three games that we've looked at, and analog horror in general, bring their sound design center stage, forcing the player to interact with and absorb a haunted AV department's worth of unsettling sounds. The old machines present you with all manner of humming, beeping, and screeching, and ask you to listen intently. The static might hide the key to progressing the story, and that faint rumbling might herald the coming of an unseen threat. Thematically, interface horror inherits a lot from analog horror. Like, for example, isolation. In each of Stories Untold's vignettes, you sit alone in a room, trapped in your own head. In Iron Lung, you're welded alone into a submarine in an isolated pocket of space. And in Day 178, the protagonist, and everyone in their city, has been trapped indoors for the better part of a year. For most people, even experiencing an interface horror story is going to be a solitary experience, since every single one of these games is single player. And not only that, they're horror games, which the ancient gamer customs dictate must be played alone with the lights off. So, like analog horror videos, interface horror games isolate not only their narrative victims, but their audiences as well. You'll find another thematic inheritance in the form of control. The canonical analog horror stories find dread in being controlled by government agencies and eldritch gods, and that can certainly ring true for interface horror as well. But as video games, interface horror stories naturally lend some control to the player, 
granting them the same terrible domineering power over their avatars that the big bads of analog horror have over entire worlds. You want to unravel the mystery of the narrative, but you know that to do so, you must command your character, who is unaware of your presence or desires, to press the buttons and open the valves on the machines that will let the monster in. This lovely expression of themes through gameplay both brings the player closer to the action as an active participant, and pulls them farther away as an impartial and curious observer. And of course, I don't know how I could talk about thematic inheritance without mentioning intrusion by an unseen force. Memories of trauma and guilt intrude upon the vignettes of stories untold. You intrude upon an alien blood ocean and iron lung, all while the blood ocean and its enigmatic inhabitant threaten to intrude upon your safe little submarine. Something invades your home and your mind in day 178, all while you intrude upon a silent city. That feeling of having an unwelcome visitor in your home, of an invisible stranger breathing down your neck, is central to the tension building of interface horror and analog horror in general. In short, interface horror borrows many of the best elements of analog horror and takes them to their extremes. They elevate 20th century technology from the set dressing of a story to its subject, from a vessel for external horrors into a horror all its own. They force you to act in isolation, to feel both controlled and in control. And what's more, these short, self-contained little stories marinate for hours without so much as a glimpse of the monster, if it wants to show you anything at all. While analog horror dresses itself in the technological trappings of the late 20th century, it seems to me to be a uniquely 21st century phenomenon. First of all, I think it's the temporal distance between us and the 20th century that allows us to view analog tech with such cautious nostalgia. And if we trace the trajectory of the subgenre all the way back to its roots, we wind up on YouTube in the mid-2010s, looking at alternate reality games. At this point in time, editing suites had become relatively easy to use, and YouTube's video hosting infrastructure had started to mature, which meant that throngs of people were making ARGs, playing ARGs, and sharing ARGs with strangers on the internet. It also meant that, later down the line, indie artists on indie budgets inspired by those ARGs could use that same technology to create and proliferate their own spins on analog horror, be it a short form video or a video game. I think analog horror arose as a reaction to uniquely 21st century circumstances too. Remember that all important theme of intrusion through analog tech? It's a theme I think a lot of us see play out in the day-to-day -day of the 21st century as foreign governments, domestic governments, and massive data-hoarding corporations siphon information about us through our phones and browsers. What's more, the intersection of isolation and technology, for example, is more pronounced now than it ever has been. When you play these games, which lock you in place, alone, dominated by old interfaces, you might catch a reflection of your own life, of the barrier of screens we put around ourselves. And if you're young like me, the thought of nuking that barrier back to the 20th century might freak you out. Those screens and the internet they connect us to expand our perceptions to a global scale. Anything less than that might feel like getting an eye gouged out. And that's a horror as old as time. Whether we can chalk it up to isolation, surveillance, overdependence, or something else, the presence and form of analog horror are a uniquely 21st century phenomenon. And as a young, popular subgenre, we're lucky enough to get to see it evolve, to see new artists and storytellers innovate on its themes, structures, and aesthetics. We even get to see how analog horror molds itself 
fit new mediums, like video games. <laughs>